Hello. What's up? Okay, so I should actually probably like readjust my light, but it's probably too late to do that now. Okay, so I think that besides my light being like super, super bright, yep, I don't know what's better. Yeah. So, I'm still trying to figure out this lighting thing. I'm one of these, um, I've got no professional training, so I don't know the best lighting and all that. So I'm learning as I go, which in all honesty, I would rather do that anyway. Hey y'all, it's Monday. What's up? Hope y'all had a great weekend. We did not do much at all. We, um, my husband, of course, he's like the boss in the newsroom or whatever, so he's got a new employee starting later this week, so he met up with, or we met up with them on Saturday, took him to lunch, and, um, kind of gave him a quick, you know, tour around Billings and all that, so we spent our Saturday kind of doing that, and then, um, yesterday, I kind of played it lazy, which was nice, we don't get very many of those days, um, so, yeah, that's all we kind of did this weekend, which I'll do. I know it's kind of a big weekend. Last week in Billings here, um, Trump came, so poor Philip spent his entire week covering Trump, which means he went into work at 7.30 in the morning and didn't get home most days until after 9 or whatever. So, he was beyond exhausted come Saturday. So, yeah, yesterday us just lounging around was... Very, very nice. Um, it was a big weekend, of course. Everybody was watching football, excited about football's return. I don't care about football. But guess what? I like football food. So I am looking forward to like lots of nachos and junk food that you know you're not supposed to eat. That's kind of my excuse. Um, yeah, Bethany, you missed out last week. <laughs> It's okay though. I completely understand. Um, at no point do I ever um, expect somebody to be here um, every week. So I'm glad you enjoyed your um, Labor Day. Hopefully, you know, with your family. All right, so getting back into the swing of things. Um, let's see. I guess that's all. I mean, I need to, um, I actually need, hey, Sarah. I need to make a um, Facebook post because, you know, at 5 o'clock every day I share a um, kind of a reminder that we so if you want to um, join us tonight, you can, or you're, you remember that, you know, I'm going live in 30 minutes. I need to um, do a um, graphic or something that I post at 5 o'clock to, you know, hey, give me a topic, something, you know, for me to talk about um, when I first come on. That way, so it gives people time to, you know, join if they want to. Because, um, yeah, I feel like a lot of times I'm rambling and if I can answer a question or have a little fun before we start the whole night, um, I'd already do that. So, if you have any questions or whatever, give me something to start off next Monday's Facebook Live. Alright, so, here we go. Tonight, we are doing Cinnamon Twister Martinis. Hi, Mom! Here's my mom, I got Sarah, I got Bethany. I'm happy, I, I know I'm not seeing talking to myself. Um, cinnamon Twister Martinis, I feel, feel like, you know, fall's, you know, just two and a half, three weeks away, so we're doing the fall martinis. Um, this one, I don't know how it's gonna be. It's probably gonna be one of those that surprises us, but um, I don't know. All right. Yep, here we go. Okay, cinnamon twister martini. You need butterscotch schnapps, you need Irish cream, you need Kahlua, you need cinnamon schnapps, schnapp. That's one of my favorite words to say, schnapps. And you need cream. Of course you need a, um, ooh. Should not have done that. Did everything like right there in front of the camera. Told y'all, learning as I go. Hey, you of course you need a shaker with ice. And this is one of those recipes where it only calls like a tiny bit of everything. So I'm actually gonna combine things into like one um, 
it's a shot glass, but it's got measuring labels or measuring units on it. So I use that to measure. All right, so you need a half part of butterscotch schnapps. Half part. You need a half part of Irish cream. So I'm combining it just because it's a whole lot easier. Half part, half part of each. Then you need one part Kahlua, which is, this is where I think it's weird. Kahlua is a coffee flavored alcohol. And it's asking for one part. So it's cinnamon twister, but it's asking for a coffee flavor. Again, I don't know. Um, oh, okay, I did dump that. You need two parts cream. One. Two. My cream was looking really thick. I sure hope it's not bad. If you see me complaining about being sick tomorrow, this was. Oh, no, it's. No, it's just probably need to be shaken up. No, it's still good. And then you need a fourth part. Just one fourth part cinnamon schnapps. Cinnamon schnapps is like super, super, super strong. So um, you only need like a little dash of it. Okay, right, so there you go. One half part butterscotch schnapps and Irish cream. One part Kahlua, two parts cream. One fourth part cinnamon schnapps. Shake it all nice. Let's see how this goes. Again, I um, don't have high hopes. I bet you it's gonna surprise me though. Bet you it will. Just because, like I said, it's one of those that, um, let me move my stuff here. I try and, try and clean as I go. It doesn't happen most of the time, but either way, move all that out of the way. Okay, so here we go. It's really good. And actually what's weird, you don't taste the Kahlua, the coffee liqueur. You actually taste more of the butterscotch schnapps and Irish cream, but it all blends very well together. It's very fall tasting. That's good. Okay, that's mango approved. All right, tonight, all right, as you guys know, as most of you guys know, I am taught pre-K for, um, 13 years, I um, went to school for it. I mean, that's where I graduated with a child and family studies degree. I, upon graduation, I started working in a child development center. And I bounced around for a while. I started off in the fours, then I taught um, school age, then I kind of floated around for a little while. Um, I've worked in all the rooms, but ultimately I ended up teaching pre-K. I taught pre-K for, um, I would say probably 11 of those 13 years, but um, so I taught four and five year olds. I taught them right before they went to kindergarten and I do pride myself. I do. I very much pride myself with um, having at least half of them reading before they went to kindergarten or um, pretty close to, you know, just reading on their own before they went to kindergarten. Um, I had 18 by myself. Alabama ratio was 18 children to one teacher for four and five year olds. So I had 18 children by myself. That means I had up to 36 in my room with another teacher. So to say I needed little tactics to um, keep control of the classroom, I mean, it's an understatement. I mean, I had to have a bunch of little methods and tricks to keep the classroom flowing keep um, children from taking over and keep me from going cuckoo. So um, there's, and actually this was one of these Facebook lives that um, a couple months ago, my husband and I were traveling somewhere and I don't know how it came up, but I mentioned um, how I used to do this, right? How I used to do this. And he's like, man, this sounds like a good Facebook live. And I'm like, what do you mean? And he was just like, think about all these little tips you're sharing. These are things that not just teachers, but parents or anybody that works with children could use 
to um, either help better understand their child or teach their child or work with their child. So um, I just wrote down a few. This is one of those things that um, I wrote down like six or so at first and then over time I just kept thinking of more and more and more and more. So I'm sure this is another Facebook Live that I will do again later with more tips because like I said, there are a lot of little things that I had to do to um, keep control of the classroom and keep me from losing my head. So, first, um, here we go. Now, I do have to tell you, my um, child care center that I came from was not the standard um, child care center or daycare. I do not like the term daycare unless they are literally babysitting the children. Daycare to me is you are taking care of my child during the day. We were a child care learning center. Your parents drop their children off with us in the morning, their child learned throughout the day, and their parents could pick them up knowing that their day was full of, um, you know, learning through play, and it wasn't just sitting around and um, watching TV or, you know, just a little bit of guidance or whatever. We were a child care learning center. We were a learning center. And um, we did get the... Um, Full accreditation, AC accreditation, N-A-E-Y-C. If you have any children, if possible, look up any N-A-E-Y-C centers in your area to put your child in that center. Um, that is pretty much the highest accreditation a center can get. Um, there are so many more standards and minimums that, they, uh, that NAC requires than state regulations. So, you want NACI reg regulations, you want a NACI center. Um, we were NACI, we got NACI um, accredited when I first started there and then we went through NACI accreditation again towards the end. It is a lot of work. I shed a lot of tears. I was up a lot of nights, but it's so worth it because you really do develop a classroom and create a classroom that is the optimum learning environment for the child. Um, so, okay, here we go. Blah, 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 blah. I go on and on and on. It's one of those things I can go forever on. Um, okay, so like I said, I had up to 18 children by myself. My playground time was at 9 o'clock every morning. Breakfast was served at 8 o'clock. One of Nacy's things is they need to serve themselves, help clean up, all that stuff. So when you are having children help you clean up and help, you, help them serve themselves, it gets messy. Well, guess what? It's also supposed to be, you know, they're also supposed to, you know, talk to each other and it's like family style breakfast or meals. So, if you're supposed to be outside at 9 o'clock and I need to get 18 children to eat their breakfast, we need to clean up, they need to get them ready to get outside before 9 o'clock because we only have a 45 minute play time, guess what? You got to come up with little tricks, especially in the winter when you got 18 kids that need to get on their um, jackets, their hats, their mittens, their scarves, and whatever else. I don't have time to sit there and dress each child individually. So, of course, we came up with a system that um, we went into. I had them all around the carpet after we cleaned up for breakfast. And I called them like four or five kids at a time to go get their jackets from their own space. They brought them back to the um, carpet. And I, once I taught them this, they dressed themselves. All right. This is my jacket, so it's much larger. So, hopefully, it's easy to tell. Um, I was not going to sit there and dress 18 children. I don't have time for that. What I taught them to do was to take their jacket and lay it down on the table or lay it down on the floor. Lay it down on the floor. And I wanted them to stand where, um, or actually the first way. They could lay their jacket down on the floor. Then they could come around and lay on top of their jacket, their back on the back side of the jacket, and then all they had to do was slide their arms in. Once they slid their arms in, they could stand up. And when it came to zipping, I had no problem. I understand developmentally, it's hard for them to zip jackets. Once they got their jacket on, I would zip a jacket. It took me no time to do that. So they laid down on their jacket, slid their arms in, and stood up. Jackets on. Or if they couldn't figure that out, laid their jacket down on the ground, if they stood to where the head was, this is kind of tricky, this is kind of tricky. 
If they couldn't put the jackets on, this is what they did. They stand where the head of the jacket was on the floor, stuck their arms in the holes like this, and then flipped it over their head and let it slide down like that. And then all they had to do was put it on over there. Just like that. So, like I said, when I had, see, pardon my um, belly. <laughs> so anyway, so that was actually the method that worked best for most of them. Just lay it down on the ground. They stood at the head facing the jacket, slipped their hands into the armholes, flipped it over their head, and then they could just slide it down onto them. That's what worked really well. Now, in the winter, hats, gloves, mittens, scarves. Um, I taught the kids to take their hat off first, take their gloves, and if they had a scarf, tuck it inside of the hat, and then hold the hat like a bag, and then shove it into one of their sleeves, the inside of one of their sleeves. That way so, when they put their jacket away inside of their space, all of it was together right there. It wasn't gonna fall out, it all stayed right there. If they have a um, pocket that's big enough, you can do that. But um, unfortunately, it was a lot easier to teach them to do it this way than to shove everything in a pocket. It's weird. Anyway, best way to keep up with mittens and hats and scarves, shove everything in a hat and then shove it in a sleeve. Just like that. All right, so, now that I just broke a sweat and I have static. All right, next ones are like, I'm just sitting here and chatting or whatever. All right, one of the most important things you can do if you have a child is to get down on their level. Um, I was not thinking when I did this ahead of time, so I didn't bring any extra paper. If you um, get down on their level, then they're able to see all of your features, they're able to see your facial expressions, they're able to um, understand and respect you more because you are right there with them. If you're, think about when somebody towers over you, how intimidated you feel. So if you get down on a child's level, they're more likely to understand and respect you. Now, when it comes to children's writing or drawing, um, developmentally by four and a half years old, children should be drawing all of the features of the body. They should be drawing, you know, eyebrows and eyelashes and noses and mouths and um, all of the features on a body. There's a lot of times that by four and a half, five years old, you still have children drawing where the um, limbs are coming out from the head. That's because when a child looks up, guess what? They see you looking down, they see the head, they know your arms are there, they know your legs are there, but they're not able to really process that there's a middle of your body connecting everything together. So when they draw, guess what? They're drawing what they see. If you get down on their level, you're going to have a more detailed drawing. You're going to have a child that draws the body, the arms and the legs coming from the body. They're going to see that the hands and the feet connect to the um, arms and legs. They're actually going to draw, draw you know, the eyebrows, the eyelashes, the hair, the ears, glasses, all the little things, all the little details that they can't see when you're towering over them. So, by four and a half years old, your child should be drawing pictures with more detail. If they're still doing this, get down on their level. That way so they can see that there's more to you than just a head and a couple of arms and legs. So, it's, that's one of my favorite things. And um, whenever children would draw, um, I could tell a lot about the way the parents interacted with the children. And in all honesty, it's just because it's just not common knowledge. Parents don't get a um, book on how to work with children. So um, that's one of the things I did try and educate my children. If you get down their level, they're more likely to have more respect and um, see you in more detail, which is a pretty big thing. All right, so. This one is, I think, kind of common sense, but in all honesty, it's something that didn't, um, I didn't pay attention to until it happened, 
Um, every morning or every morning and afternoon, I would do a little group time um, with three or four kids on a specific skill. And um, there was another teacher in the room with me at the time. And she noticed that one of the little girls, that every time it came to do anything on paper or anything um, with detail, she would lay her head down on the table. And she would do it, you know, really, you know, she laid her head, I mean, literally laid her head down on the table. And that's how she did her work. And this other teacher brought it up to the parent. And guess what? Took them to the doctor. The child had horrible eyesight. Ended up with um, glasses, had astigmatism, had tons and tons and tons of eye problems. They got her on glasses. It wasn't even a few days later, and all of a sudden, this child was a new child. She was running and playing more. She, um, her work was becoming so much more detailed and clear. Um, and it was all because we were like, we don't know why she keeps laying her head on the table. So. Typically, think about when you, if you're writing something or drawing or doing anything with detail, are you pulling it close, further away? Are you um, having to squint? Same thing with a child. Pay attention to that. Children don't get eye tests a lot of times until they go to school. So a lot of times they don't get um, any of that information or any help until they're five and a half, six, seven years old. So a lot of times you have these clues before they even go to school. So just pay attention to that. Okay, right. this was something, this is really weird, but when you have 18 children and you need to get their attention quickly, don't yell. Even if you have one child and he's, you know, really, really loud or whatever, I'm just saying he in general, um, don't yell. Because guess what they want to do? They want to yell back. Um, whisper. If you whisper, that makes them want to stop and listen to what you're saying. So if you speak with a lower tone or a whisper, that forces them to stop what they're doing, a lot of times turn and look at you, and actually be quiet so they can hear what you're saying. So instead of yelling to get their attention, now this of course works only if they're like within range, if they are playing at the neighbor's kid next, you know, house next door, it ain't gonna work. So use common sense people, but whisper. It's going to get their attention a whole lot quicker than yelling. Another thing, if you work with children and have a large group of children, this was one of our favorite things to do at group time. Before I started group time and they were all sitting there talking and playing with each other, what I would do, get a bag. And I'd sit here and I'd just, I'd just sit here and look at them. I'd just shake it and be like, hey, and I'd whisper it. Guess what's in my bag? Guess what is in my bag? And the kids would be like, what? She's got something in her bag. And then, guess what? You don't have to put anything in the bag. This is, you know, let them use their imagination. You could do this every single day. They'll be amused every single day. Ask them, what do you think is in my bag? And then just go child by child. What do you think is in the bag? Every once in a while, if their attention starts, you know, going off or whatever, <gasps> Ooh, one of you is right. What's in the bag? Now, that was able to get everybody on the carpet together, got their attention and focus on me, got them calmed down. That way, so when we got done going through every single child, I could go into group time and I had their attention the rest of the time. So, um, something little, what's in the bag? If you wanted to change it up, the next day you say, ooh, guess what? I've got something blue in my bag. And then they could list things that are blue. I've got something that starts with the letter G. I've got um, a square something. Get them to you know, be creative, use their imaginations. You can write down their answers if you want. But guess what? It's imaginary. It doesn't matter. If they ever ask you what's in the bag, well, it's in your imagination. One of the big things about pre-K, uh, they start understanding at um, four and a half, four, four and a half, five years old, is the difference between real and pretend. So that really helps with that as well. Okay, this is something, let's see if I can, okay. I've shared it before as a post. If you have a child that's learning how to write their name or write anything, one of your best bets is a plain old piece of paper and a highlighter. 
if you start with that dotted paper and then you write their name on it, it is really hard for them to see the lines mixed up with the dotted lines and then the solid lines. So this needs to be your last step. Your first step, and it doesn't have to be yellow, it just needs to be a light color, is, and it's hard for you to see, I guess. Just take a piece of paper and in a light color, write their name. A young child that is just learning how to um, write can then at that point just take their writing utensil and trace over what you wrote. It is a whole lot easier for them to see how the letters form when you do it like that. If you have a child that it masters that or is struggling with that, if you want, you can um, draw an arrow that tells them which way to go. So, of course, they would go up there, go down there, and up there. That's all you do, just draw arrows. Now, once they master um, tracing over the um, highlighted name, at that point, then you can go to the dots. Because at that point, they should be able to know what the letters are and they can trace over the dots. The next um, step after that then would be to put them onto the dotted lines and then they trace over that as well. The last step, of course, none of that. Just give them a piece of paper and something to write with and they should be able to write their name. Um, I was able to get kids writing their name so much more quickly when I started them out like this or writing um, any letters, words. It was so much easier to get them writing when I started out with them tracing first. If I ever started them out with the um, dots first, it was hard for them to understand the formation of the letters. So um, that always works best for me. Like I said, up to 36 kids, my goal was to have the majority of them ready for more than ready for kindergarten. Okay, um, I shared this in my Fine Motor Skills Facebook Live a few weeks ago, um, helping with Fine Motor Skills and scissors, concentration, focus, draw some lines on some paper, they can, if they want to, I mean you could give them a marker and they can trace over it, or um, just some scissors and see if they can cut the lines. It is very hard for a child to put their fingers in those holes and go up and down, up and down, and move it at the same time. You'd be surprised how difficult. And of course, that, if that's the time when you start actually realizing if they're right-handed or left-handed. So um, really pay attention to that. So you just see if they can cut out the lines. This is something that is good for rainy day activity or if um, you need to be quiet for a little while. Give them some um, paper, some scissors. You don't have to write lines. Just Throw it all on the table and just let them go to town. Children love scissors and paper. Um, if you have an older child that is struggling still but they have mastered being able just to follow the line, see if they can cut out shapes or letters. So there's always a way to challenge a child that um, has mastered a you know specific skill. Um, let's see, moving right along. Who's still hanging out with me? <laughs> um, one of the things that helped me to help teach parents about letters was um, I did not sing the alphabet song. I never, well, I don't want to say I didn't sing it. I know a lot of people, that's their, that's their go-to. When they hear the alphabet, that's the first thing they think of to do, sing the alphabet song. I didn't sing it very often in my class because guess what? It's easy to memorize. I can go A, B, C, D, E, F, G, but do I know what a D looks like? Do I know what sound it makes? Can I come up with a word that starts with D? It's just a song that they memorize. So I didn't sing it all. Um, I didn't sing it very often. But the way I had to break it down to parents is when 
we're teaching them a letter, can they identify the upper and lower case of that letter? Can they recall the sound on their own? If you um, tell them, can you give me a word that starts with this letter? Can they give it to you? Can they go and find something that starts with that letter? Do they know the shape of it? Can they write it? Um, like I, said, I just typed up, you know, some examples. Um, if I give them this set of letters, can they find the letter A? Do they know what the letter A looks like? Do they know the lowercase? Do they know uppercase? Can they write uppercase and lowercase? If I give them a set of pictures, can they tell me that baseball starts with B and B says B and apple starts with A and A says A and um, that kind of thing. Um, what sound does the letter A, a make? Can you give me a word that starts with letter A? There are so many little pieces of um, information that goes along with the letters that the alphabet song doesn't do. Like I said, it's just a song. It's fine if you sing it, but don't get excited when they learn it because it's memorization. Yeah, that's probably a big... Um, it's probably not very fun for a lot of people to hear right now because, like I said, what do they learn from it? It's memorization. That's just any song on the radio right now. It's the ABC song. It's memorization. They're not learning anything from it. Um, so, there's that. Okay. Hi, Susanna. All right. One of the things, the easiest, okay, the toughest thing for me to teach, it actually, I want to pull my hair out when I taught it. Rhyming words. For some reason, rhyming words was the most difficult thing to teach. If you asked kids what rhymed with cat, a lot of times they said dog. They told you something was the opposite. They don't, and this goes with the, um, you know, understanding letter sounds and understanding the alphabet. Um, whenever I was teaching reading and um, rhyming words, I always pulled a Dr. Seuss book out. And I actually always started with um, The Cat in the Hat because when I was in college in my children's lit class, we had to pick an author to give a you know speech about. And I learned that the reason why Dr. Seuss wrote The Cat in the Hat is because a publisher came up to him and said, hey, here's 250 words that the average um, four and five year old should know. Make a book. And guess what he did? He wrote The Cat in the Hat. So if you want your child to learn how to read, go pull out a book, um, go pull out um, Cat in the Hat. That's got the two, uh, well it doesn't have all, I don't think it has all the words. But he used the words that the, that the average four and five year old should know. You know, basically in kindergarten. So, um, I always read that book. And that's what actually helped me with rhyming because you know Dr. Seuss is all about the rhyming words. The other activity that helped me with um, teaching rhyming words and sight words and letter sounds recognition, recognition was um, I would take two basic letters. I take A and T. A says A, ah, T says T. Put the sounds together, you had at. So they knew at, 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 at. Every single one of those meant or said at. Then what I would do, if I can find the end of my tape here and take it apart. Should have beforehand. <laughs> um, I would then challenge them to think of the letter sound and then the word that I already had on here. So if I got at, they know that all of these words are um, at. So if I, I'm not going to do all these because you get the point. Alright, so if I give them if I hold up the letter B, what sound does B make? B. A T says at. So if I put the B 
with the at. What word is that? Bat. K. At. Cat. At. Fat. And you just kept going down. On and on and on. So this is what worked the best for me. So they learned bat, cat, fat, hat, pat, rat. All of those rhymed. And they learned how to read because B says B, at. This is what worked the best for me. They learned sight words and they learned rhyming. This was the only way I could get my kids to learn rhyming words. And then I would change it to like end in like OG or um, ET. You could change it any way you want. But this was the only way that I could get my children to understand how to put letters together to make, um, and that was another thing. I always, um, we had, we said this every day. You have letters. You put letters together to make words. You put words together to make sentences. You put sentences together to make paragraphs and you read. So, I mean, that's how I had to teach my children and that worked wonderfully. Um, I actually think that was like the most beneficial thing I ever did with any of my teaching. <laughs> all right, the last little tip I have here. Um, this is for all parents, not just teachers. This is for parents as well. Um, remember, please remember that the average attention span for your child is about their age in minutes. So if you have a two-year-old, they're only gonna be able to pay attention for about two minutes. If you have a four or five-year-old, they're only gonna be able to pay attention for about five minutes. So I say this because if you are making them sit down at a restaurant and your four-year-old 10 minutes later all of a sudden starts going ballistic and won't sit down and won't be quiet, guess what? They are six minutes past their limit. You can't expect a child to sit down or be still or be quiet for that long. So if you've got a three-year-old, you've got about three minutes of focus time for them. If you don't keep them engaged and interested, guess what? When that three minutes is up, they're going to move on. You can't get upset with them. You can't reprimand them. You can't discipline them if they're bored. Think about it. Think about when you go and have to sit in a meeting or think about when you um, are driving. I, of course, you know, our ability to focus and keep attention is a lot longer. But at some point, guess what? You need some help. So, parents, the biggest thing you can do is to remember your three-year-old is three years old. After three minutes, if they've been sitting there and watching TV and they want to get up and run around, that's natural. It's developmentally appropriate. That's what they're supposed to do. If they get up and start pushing or shoving or throwing, guess what? That's natural. You need to give them something to bring back their attention. That was something I had to constantly remember my, remind myself during group time with 18 kids. They're four and five years old. I could keep their attention for about four minutes, but if I didn't have all the bells and whistles and song and dance, guess what? They went off into La La Land or they started you know, poking at each other, whatever. Best way for you to keep behavior problems at bay is to remember how old they are and their attention span and to keep them busy or have always have a plan for what you're going to do next. That's it. So, like I said, um, I only, upon planning this on Facebook Live, I came into this with only like five or six little things that I was going to talk about. I ended up, um, I think I've got nine or ten. And I ended up writing down a bunch more. So I'm going to have another one of these. I don't know when. I've got a bunch of Facebook Lives planned. So I don't know when I'm going to do the next one. But 
I've got so many more of these little things. And um, if you are a teacher or a parent and have a great tip or um, something that might benefit others, please send it my way. I would love to share it in the next Facebook Live. All right, so, um, of course, I just said send me your ideas. Um, if you haven't yet, follow the Facebook page, Instagram page, Pinterest page, YouTube page, um, share it with your friends, give me your ideas, send me your ideas, let me know what you want to see in the future. Um, next week, I have a few quick Play-Doh recipes. Now that um, I know here, I know it's not in the South, um, here it's starting to cool down and it's going to get to where you can't go outside as often. So um, these are some quick little recipes that you can whip up really quickly to occupy those children when they're stuck inside. Um, or shove in a bag and take with you somewhere. That way so you can easily pull it out of your bag and have it ready for when they get bored and need some entertainment. And we will start with the Snickertini Martini. I think it's like a snickerdoodle, I think. So, like a snicker, snickerdoodle martini? Yeah, something like that. All right, so anyway, there you go. Thank you guys so much for joining me this evening. I look forward to seeing you guys next Monday. And until then, hope you guys have a great evening and a great rest of your week.